<clears throat> All right, well, I have to thank Joe for that uh, excellent talk. Um, and Joe, actually, you answered a question I've been wrestling with quite a lot, and I think a number of other people were wrestling with. Uh, I'm not sure I fully comprehend the answer, but I feel like it was in your talk, and I have to mull it over and maybe discuss it with you a bit more. But part of it is, like, why are certain things happening? And I'll get to what those things are momentarily. Uh, anyway, I'm Evan Malone. I'm the founder of NextFab Studio. Uh, and uh, like Joe, I, I'm a city person. Uh, I didn't grow up in the city, but I sort of fell in love with the city. Um, and I decided to start my company here, uh, in part because you know I like to walk to where I'm working. Uh, I don't like to have to drive to get my groceries. Uh, and I like the density of minds, the density of energy, the density of creativity. And I feel like uh, there was a lot that I could do here in the city. So I, I really love Philadelphia for the opportunities it presented me. But first, I want to go back to sort of the dark things that were also in my mind that motivated me to start the kind of business that I did start. And it's NextFab Studio, in case I didn't mention that. Uh, it was my feeling after a PhD in mechanical engineering that uh, you know, looking at manufacturing, talking to people, manufacturing capacity in the US was threatened. I kept hearing about uh, offshoring of traditional manufacturing. Now, I didn't do any studies on the capacity of the United States, so. I was just sort of taking these anecdotes and, and building this sort of brooding sense of uh, a downhill slide in the US. Um, but the reasons seem to be plausible, cost of labor differential relative to other countries, a difference in educational focus. You know, we're, we're sort of up here at the sort of cutting edge of uh, science, basic research, marketing and finance, and other countries are back in you know, how to machine things, how to do efficient mass production. And that really makes them a better location for efficient production. So it's hard to work against that. Um, at the same time, it seems like, you know, and through some anecdotes uh, in my own life, in graduate school, I experienced some reasons why uh, our innovation, our capacity to innovate might be threatened. Uh, we have some immigration policies that make it difficult for people with advanced degrees, for instance, or anybody who's highly motivated or wants to start a business to stay in the United States and do so. And it seems silly that we should have barriers to people who are really willing and able to contribute to our economy. And lastly, we're at sort of in a mode right now of using debt to buy luxury items from other people, from other countries. And this is really just a, an accelerating economic decline. Now, with the darkness over, we can turn to some positive things that we can look at. So the US has a really great culture. I'm proud to say I really like the culture here. That's not surprising. I was born here. But I feel like we are still the, uh, the world leaders in creativity. We embrace diversity. We embrace the differences and the challenges. Uh, we take pride in challenging establishment. So that means we are able to adapt, react quickly. So that generates a lot of hope in terms of what we can do for the future. And I think there's also a strong spirit of community service and knowledge sharing here, sort of helping your, your fellow man do better. So, that innovation culture is still strong and broad-based. It's in a lot of people. It's not just in a sort of a very thin veneer. There's also some new technological advances that uh, uh, I think have enabled some new cultural innovations, which I hope my business is a part of. And that is uh, something I call digital fabrication. And this is hardware and software technology. Together, these things have resulted in uh, sort of an upsurge of collaborative communities and shared tools. And I think Philadelphia may be the premier city in the United States, if not the world, in terms of uh, embracing this new movement. So uh, a brief uh, background on digital fabrication. Digital fabrication is software-driven technology for fabricating physical objects. That's my definition. There isn't really good terminology for this yet, and different people have different terms, and I apologize if I'm ignoring your term for this. You can tell me what it is. It may be better than this. but. Uh, this includes things like 3D printing, laser cutting, CNC milling, and the CAD CAM software and, and design tools that uh, allow people to design for these processes. Uh, there's a great benefit to these tools, which is that uh, in the past, traditional manufacturing processes required vast investment up front, and then you'd start to make your money back when you produced millions of objects. These processes are about every object is about the same cost. You can change your design on a whim because it's in the software. And the, the tool doesn't really require any reconfiguration to make one type of object uh, versus the next. Uh, the cost and complexity of these tools is declining rapidly. That means 
they can be taught to non-experts. You don't necessarily have to have an advanced degree to learn how to, to use digital fabrication technology. And uh, they're also manageable for time sharing, meaning that uh, they're not so hazardous, they're not so expensive that we can't sort of get together with some of our friends, if you have a garage space, get a laser engraver and start a you know, cottage shop or just tinkering around. And this is happening a lot. So I did some work uh, in my graduate degree, just to take this a little bit deeper, in low-cost 3D printing. So 3D printing is this technology where you have a three-dimensional shape, and the machine, rather than carving raw materials away, it glues material together and builds the object up layer upon layer. Um, technology has been around since the 80s. It's not brand new or anything like that, but it has been cost prohibitive for individuals to have access to until the last five, six years when some patents started to lapse and uh, a number of people, myself included, started to make uh, DIY versions of this technology. So this is one I worked on called Fab at Home. There are lots of other ones uh, that have been also in the news. So this is an example of a product you can make with a fab at home. And actually, can we start that video? Have to click it. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so in this process, uh, there's a couple of different materials. They're just being squirted out of a syringe. The, the concept is really simple. Uh, the magic is really that I just sat down in a, in a piece of software and I designed this shape. Now I'm including some mass-produced objects. I have an LED that's in the front of this. Uh, but this is a bathtub caulk that you're seeing and some uh, hardware store epoxy that makes it rigid. So there's a skin of bathtub caulk. has a nice sort of uh, grippy feel on the outside. And then I'm making a, a sort of a chamber for batteries to go in. And then you'll see some uh, yellowish stuff. That is electrically conductive material. It's uh, just bathtub caulk with silver particles in it. This is the rest of the circuit. And finally, through the magic of uh, Windows Media Player, whatever this was, Movie Maker, sorry, you can pop in the batteries. And there's a working prototype flashlight. So that's powerful. Uh, and that was, you know, that's, that's one object from a simple, this is a $3,000 build your own kind of machine. Um, moving back to the PowerPoint, let's see. Oops. 